Eric Schalgen gets the call again against the Carolina Hurricanes. And we have some trades to talk about in the NHL that might impact how the Leafs approach the NHL trade deadline. We'll look at that and more on today's edition of Locked On Leafs. Your Locked On Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Locked on Leaf podcast, your daily fix for all things Leafs. I'm your host, David Morissuti from Sportsnet. And of course, with Micah still away on vacation. Yes, he is still away on vacation. That lucky, lucky person. But don't worry. I still got some help. Joining me today is another guest co-host, Peter Berrichini. Is that I'm going to go Italian here. We got the Italian. Oh, yeah, you, 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 you got the CH perfectly there. Oh, uh, I, I saw that. And I'm like, I am making sure I'm emphasizing that. <laughs> uh, he is a writer over at hockey at the Hockey Writers and co-host of the Sticks in the Six podcast. Just remember, everyone, that Locked on Leaves is a daily Maple Leaf-centric podcast. So be sure to subscribe for free wherever you get your podcast from. And now you can catch us on YouTube so you get to see my lovely face. And Peter's lovely head of lettuce. <laughs> I'm just, yes, I am going to go hockey with the lettuce joke because I do not have any of that. Um, so Peter, hair was, first, hair first, was a little bit longer before I got it chopped off. So this is the fresh new look for the year kind of thing. I'm liking that. I'm liking that. Well, I want to thank <laughs> you for joining us. We do have a oh, thank you for having show. me. Yeah, jam packed show for today because we have some trades to kind of talk about that have, in, I mean, an impact on the leads just because of who was involved. And we're going to kind of discuss maybe what the Leafs, this kind of shapes a little bit more of what the Leafs are going to be doing ahead of the trade deadline. We're also going to discuss some prospect talk because that is one of Peter's specialties. Uh, and, and especially with the Leafs having a little bit of news about potential call-ups of their prospects in here that caught my attention. And of course there is a game Thursday against the Carolina Hurricanes. So we're going to preview that and give our thoughts on that matchup. But first and foremost, a trade did happen in the NHL. No, the Leafs did not make a trade, but they did make it with there was a, one of their rivals going up against one of their potential playoff opponents, depending on how things shake out. Yes, I know the Florida Panthers likely don't play the Leafs in round one, depending on where the Leafs finish the standings. I, I could be eating my words in a few months, but the Florida Panthers acquired Ben Sherrod from the Montreal Canadiens and a pretty decent, I'm not, you know what? I know we're a Leaf podcast, but I'll give Montreal a little bit of credit here. They did get Mm -hmm. a decent haul for a pending free agent, Ben Schrod. They got Tyler Smolanik, a first round pick in 2023 and a fourth round pick in 2022. Florida did not have Montreal retain any salary in the trade because they did move Frank Vitrano to the New York Rangers for, guess what? A fourth round pick, which was then flipped. (laughs) to Montreal. So pretty much they use Frank Vitrano as part of this return. And, you know, I'm just, I'm seeing this trade and I'm thinking I'm kind of glad the Leafs didn't do this. Yeah. Agreed. Because <laughs> you see what Josh Manson got two days ago, two days, two days ago, if I'm, I, yeah. my dates are all mixed up here, but a couple of days ago, and then you see what, Ben Sherratt got today, and I'm just like, what in the world is Florida thinking with this deal? I mean, good for the Leafs in terms of this is a you know, th- if this is the best that Florida is going to be able to do ahead of the trade deadline, you're kind of happy about this because this is this is some pretty heavy assets to get a defenseman that I feel like does doesn't really move the needle for them when you consider the type of roster that Florida has right now. Yeah, and obviously they're looking up to shore their defense. You know, you you already got a solid top pairing in. Um, you know, Aaron Ekblad and Mackenzie Weger. Um, obviously that he's going to be more of that pivot on the third pairing. Um, but like you mentioned, the price was just a little bit too high, even for my liking. Uh, obviously, we went for uh, the Montreal Canadiens to get you know a decent middle six prospect, first round. And, and an additional fourth. Um, but let's face it, the Florida Panthers are in a good spot. They're in it to win it. Um, it 
I mean, you, like you said, depending on the positioning that they're in, um, it doesn't really matter because they're trying to go. They're, they're they're the top they're the top team for a reason. You know, they're they're at the top of the Atlantic Division. You know, one of the best records, and they want to go far. You know, they want to make a significant impact with the roster that they have, with the forwards and the talent, with you know even new additions like Sam Bennett last year, Sam Reinhart this year. Um, yeah, and he, even in comparison to Josh Manson, uh, that, that, that that I would pay the price more for Josh Manson, that second round, um, you know, mid level prospect for that than giving up a first for Ben Sherrod. And even the price that the Maple Leafs pay to get, you know, Ilya Labushkin, I think that was something that you know played more in their favor and was at a cheaper cost to address the positional need than going after an overpaying Ben Sherrod. Um, similar to the way that many are like comparing to Nick Foligno last year and how that that could have been a very risky scenario given how they paid a price. It worked well in the beginning, but then the injury hit and it didn't quite work out. So, you know, the cautious move from the Maple Leafs was really, really great on their part, but even the price in comparison to what other players are going for on the market, really big, significant pay job from the Florida Panthers, considering that I would view as Josh Manson as a better defenseman. Yeah, especially considering he. Pl- I I know that for the Leafs fit and tr- I, I like a Manson would have fit better fit better for the Leafs because he's a mm-hmm. right shot. But we also know that Josh Manson had a no trade clause and was yeah. likely not waiving that to go to the to go to the Leafs. And so, like that's the other thing to consider here too. Ben Schrod, I feel like didn't really fit what the Leafs were looking for in terms of if you're going to get a guy like Ben Schrod, you probably would have preferred him on the right side. I know we've kind of heard the name Jacob Middleton. Peter LeBron brought that mm-hmm. that name up. And you kind of feel like that would be a little bit better in terms of the salary isn't going to kill you there. So you don't have to make a move where you have to clear out a bunch of salary just to get a Jacob Middleton to fit in your lineup. And I don't see Jacob Middleton fetching a first round pick yeah. <laughs> in a trade as well. Like I, I just feel like if the Leafs are going for a rental defenseman, I mean, we've heard the name Mark Giordano. Does this trade for Sherratt kind of change the market for Mark Giordano? Um, I don't. I, I don't think it'll tra- change the market. Um, I, I, I think that you know, if I mean, uh, it's difficult to see how things will 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 pan out. Um, I mean, obviously, when you get a price like that, you want to try and maximize the potential and say, hey, this is what we're going to get for Giordano. Um, but considering the fact that, um. They're 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 in a sell mode. Obviously, they want to get as much of a return as possible. But he's clearly, that he's at the top of the Maple Leafs list, and clearly, that it's going to be in a price range where they're going to be able to afford it. And if uh, the Kraken are looking to get you know picks and prospects in return, if the Maple Leafs are willing to move a mid level prospect without giving up a first, um, that'll probably be a big win. And you know, the Maple Leafs do have some really talented names in that mid level. Uh, group aside from their top names, you know, the, you got Ronnie here, in you have, um, you know, Nick Abrisese is a name that we're probably going to touch on it a bit later. Um, even, you know, some players with promise like Mikhail Abramov, William Villeneuve, um, I would even throw in Dmitry of Chinnikov, um, uh, right there who recently came over and is uh, getting some reps and practice time with the Marlies. So they have a decent prospect pool to try and move some players around. Even if they're not willing to move a top name, I think that's off the table unless you're getting a top tier name with term. And that's the only time you're going to be looking at moving your first overall or you're not first overalls, your first round picks, your top prospects. But if it is in the right wheelhouse to bring in Giordano, even with the overpayment of uh, Ben Schrott, I think they're going to come to some sort of agreement with the Kraken that maybe, hey, this is what we're willing to give. If, you're willing, if we're willing to make a deal, so be it. Yeah, and I mean the other thing that needs to be mentioned here is that Florida didn't have their 2022 pick to give up mm-hmm. because they traded it in a. I can't remember who exactly they traded for. I believe it was for Buffalo with Sam with the Sam it's Reinhardt Reinhard? deal. Okay, that would make sense. I know that it was in one of the. I know it wasn't in the Sam Bennett deal, so Reinhardt does make a little more sense. They I mean they've made so many moves over there in Florida that it's. You're like trying to figure out uh, where all the picks have gone. Actually, I could have just looked at the sheet right here um, that I do have. Now, when you look at, and you kind of mentioned this too, 
about what you would give up to get a player with term. Do you feel like I had a discussion with this, uh, with a friend, uh, with Om, actually with uh, Tic Tac Tomar. That's how he would like to be referred. So I will refer him as Tic Tac Tomar. <laughs> And he, and he kind of also mentioned the idea of getting a player with term and maybe the tough part is figuring out how that would fit next year and all that. But I kind of feel like the Leafs, let's say they go after a Jacob Chikorin and they move, like, you know, when it comes to, like, the salary part of it, they move some of the guys who are kind of on the roster right now that are not exactly fitting in, probably like a Travis Dermott and I'm, I mean, you can you can throw out other names out there. You could even say a, a package around, you know, surrounding like a Justin Hall or something like that, like to make the salary work. I also kind of feel like the Leafs wouldn't would kind of be okay to go into the prospect pool a little bit because they're getting a player of a caliber of a Jacob Chicken who is signed for another three years and is a proven, you know, top four defenseman, even in most yeah. cases a top pairing defenseman. Like I'm assuming that if you're gonna trade a prospect, that's the guy you wanna go for. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, I, I think even looking at the price, I, th- um, I uh, recently saw that you know the Coyotes are trying to swing for the fences. It was, I, I believe, it was Greg Wyshynski who said that that they want to try and maximize the potential because before he went down with uh, his latest injury, Jacob Chikorin was you know on fire. You know, I think he scored back to back two goals. Uh, you know, including that overtime win against the Maple Leafs. We will not talk about what happened in overtime, but, you know, he, he he's, he's a fantastic player. He's a fantastic two-way mobile puck moving defender, um, solid in his own zone, and he's got a howitzer of a shot. I mean, that's what you want to look for in a defenseman. And if you are looking to bring in that kind of a player, yeah, you, you got to throw in your first. You got to throw in your top prospects. And... And let's face it, four point six million over three years, that's something that's definitely in their wheelhouse that they could try and work around. Even if you're moving pieces out to try and bring one in, as long as you have the main components, like those first and top prospects, you could try and shed some more salary in between there. And you know, and, and even recently they were in they were out scouting, I believe it was Arizona Coyotes and Boston Bruins game. And you try to make a, you know, deductive reasoning of who they're trying to look out for and who they're scouting. Cause I'm pretty sure they were looking at Jacob Chikrin, maybe Carol Vimelka, um, maybe trying to prove their goaltending. I don't know, but let's face it. The biggest fish out there is Jacob Chikrin. And there were quite a number of teams at that game. So yeah, if you are going for him, um, you know, that is definitely a price to pay. Cause you got it. You got the term, you got great value. Um, if you are trying to pay for that, I, I, I probably wouldn't hesitate. And it, I said this at the beginning of the year, even when the Maple Leafs or Jacob Chikrin's name was on there, if you're going for him, I would leave no prospect untouched, no picks untouched. Everything's on the table to try and bring him in because he is definitely worth it. Yeah. And I kind of feel like at some point you need to avoid these constant moves for rentals and then not having them pan out, and then you're going into the draft kind of fully yeah. depleted with your picks. Look, and we've seen the Leafs work a little bit of magic, get guys undrafted, college signings later in the draft. But, you know, it's also nice if you once more can have that first-round pick to get that stud prospect who can either be an impact player on your roster or someone you can swing in mm-hmm. a deal yeah. as well. Um, we're going to take a, a short break right now. We're going to hear from one of our show sponsors, but, and when we come back, we're going to get into a little bit of prospect talk because, uh, we heard a little bit of in, an interesting nugget about a couple of them that might be here sooner than some thing. Before we get to that, let's hear from today's show sponsor. And that is BetOnline.net. It's that time of year again as college basketball's tournament is finally upon us. From all the latest odds, contests, and player props, BetOnline.net is the number one source for all your sports betting needs and info. BetOnline remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sporting wagering information needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino games. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and actions. Bet online, it's where the game starts. 
Hello and welcome back to the Locked On Leafs podcast. I'm your co-host, David Morissuti, and joined with me is my a good friend that I've had some great conversations on Twitter with. Uh, that is Mr. Peter Barracchini from the Hockey Writers. And one of Peter's specialties is looking at prospects. He does a lot of stuff around the draft, and I love hearing his views on the Leafs prospect system. So why not get his thoughts on a couple of prospects we heard Talked about by Elliot Friedman earlier this week on sports, and he was on the Jeff Merrick show. And he said that Matthew Nyes and Nick Abruzzese's were getting potential call up notions in April. When you heard that, what did you think? Um, obviously, a little bit of confusion considering that you know, you there's still prospects in development, you don't want to rush them, but at the same time. You want to give them the opportunity, and let's face it, both players were at team were playing for Team USA at the recent Olympic Games. Um, you know, Avery says he had four points in four games, and I believe Nice had a couple points. I believe two in four as well. Um, yeah, two points in four games as well. So if you know, obviously it was difficult with the time zones to you know stay up and watch these games. But if you had a chance to watch Avery says he and Nice it was definitely worth a ticket of admission because granted Matthew, I, 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 I'm going to start with Nick Abersese first because he's a bit of a player that's sort of flown under the radar. And maybe some of that, like I mentioned before, it could use as a potential trade ship. Um, definitely a little bit undersized, um, not the biggest player, but I've noticed that, uh, you know, obviously he's five, nine, one sixty. obviously people are going to look at that as like, Oh, he's never going to make the NHL, but He's got a fantastic work ethic. He's got energy, drive, and the poison confidence to always improve his game. And the fact that he has that going for him makes him a really great prospect to have and probably use as a trade chip because pe- because teams do like those kind of players that possesses the smarts and awareness to try and improve their game. And we saw his playmaking abilities, his ability to go in the corners and not even be afraid of, you know, despite the size differential, he's he, he's going to fight and battle in those corners and you know 28 points in 25 games with harvard this season despite missing all of last season because of uh the COVID 19 pandemic um yeah it, it's really great to see him take this massive stride and be that kind of impact player still with harvard and yeah it may not be the same amount of points the uh, 44 from 2019 20 in his freshman year where he looked absolutely fantastic but the skill set's still there and in regards to Nyes, I, I think maybe he's more on their radar because I think maybe they're higher on him um, given his ability to be that highly skilled power forward that can play in any situation. I mean, he's like he's a full package kind of player. And if it weren't for I, I believe he was diagnosed with COVID-19 at the beginning of the season, had some inconsistencies. If he if he was on top of his game, there were talks that he could have been a first rounder in that, you know, 15 to 25 range. And, you know, there were some uh, scouts online that I know that, you know, ha- were high of him and, you know, wanted him in the first round because he had really great hands. He has a lethal shot, just like, you know, certain uh, Maple Leaf sniper and Austin Matthews. It seems like he's got that build, that size, and obviously he's a- he's able to throw the body around. You know how many people have always talked about, oh, the Leafs aren't tough enough. Well, Nice has that frame. He has a physicality to him, but he also has the smarts to uh, come back on the back check. Again, the offensive awareness. So if they're looking at like two players to try and insert into their lineup, um, you know, with a lot of youth, a lot of talent and a lot of potential, why not look at both of them? Um, Obviously, you're going to have to insert one bench or not bench, but like, you know, healthy scratch the other and try and rotate them in and out. But it'll be interesting to see how that'll pan out because... One is a mid mid range prospect that can amount to something, and you know you have one that's really taking major leaps and bounds. And the Maple Leafs took a chance on him, and he, Matthew Nyes is like at one point one of the top leaders in points per games, and he still is at the collegiate level among freshmen. I mean, you look at some of the names like Josh Doan, Sean Farrell, Luke Hughes. All those guys are ahead of him, but you know he has a respectable point nine three points per game, twenty seven and twenty nine with Minnesota and he's only going to get better. So if he's able, if the collegiate season comes to an end for both of them, 
I, I have no issue trying to give them a look and see what they got. Yeah. And I think, and my always, my question about this is always, you know, obviously their season will be over by that point. Cause I think the frozen four is at the beginning of April, April mm-hmm. 7th and 9th. So my question would always be, are they, you know, the least might think they're ready, but there's a little matter of, do they think they want to leave school yet? Because yeah. we know that Nick, I says they being at Harvard wouldn't exactly want to leave early. Mm-hmm. You go to Harvard kind of for a reason as well. Matthew nice is in his first year. So like, yeah. I know some kind of do that just to get themselves some, ex, you know, some playing experience. But would would there be a problem with any of them considering sticking around because they're just they don't think it's the t- their time to move up? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, they if they still feel like they want to stay and develop and own their craft, then that, fine. I have no issue with that. I mean, this is all just speculation and. The possibility of bringing them up and you know i i build, i'm not sure what their contract status is but i believe that they still need to be signed in order to be a part of the roster and, and come on up um i'm just trying to see here i don't see either nice or abrisese with their contract status I, i'm gonna have to double check on that but i mean Obviously, it's a difficult situation because we know how some players, they want to like play out their collegiate career before committing committing, and, you know, even if they sign their contract, they obviously, they still stay there. They still want to play until they make the decision. Yeah, I think I'm good to come up and, and make the NHL. Uh, but yeah, it, it, all, it, all, it all rests on the player's shoulders. I mean, the team can try and say, hey, we really think that you progress well. What we saw this year, especially in the case of Knives, um, you know, making a significant impact and making some highlight real plays with the Minnesota this year. So if, if they feel ready, so be it. If it's a mutual understanding and agreement between both team or management and the players, then, it, then yeah, it, why not give them that opportunity? And if they feel ready again, so be it. And I kind of wonder, you know, with, uh, with the thought of maybe the Leafs will try to look to add to the lower part of the line, or maybe they just think, for the assets that we could spend to trade for somebody, maybe a Matthew Nyes, if we feel he is ready, because this is a guy who played for the men's Olympic team. He didn't play. You know, he was going to be in the World Juniors, and he was kind of off to a good start there. Oh, well, yeah. Maybe they just kind of think, we, we just think he's ready regardless, and we can plug him right into the lineup, and maybe they make a move elsewhere <clears throat> in terms of trying to figure out the depth in that regard, but... My 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 concern, as you said, with that Brusese is the size. Maybe, maybe he's just not ready to step right into the NHL. I mean, they can give them a look for a few games, and then maybe they convince them to go to the Marlies. Do you think that if there's any inkling that they would go to the Marlies, that one or I or both might be like, I don't know if that's where we want to go, or do you kind of just think that professional hockey get them up here? It won't really matter for them. I mean, the Marlies are always an option. I mean, the Maple Leafs do have a really great development system, and we saw that with, you know, um, recently with Rasmus Sandin coming up, Timothy Lilligren, recently Eric Schalgren, um, who has looked, you know, really comfortable in his first, you know, 110 minutes or so as a Maple Leaf. Um, but if there is a situation where they feel like um, to bring them up into the Toronto Marlies to so still – be to uh, sort of acclimate themselves to the professional level because the collegiate level is still not really amateur, but it's still at that junior level pace kind of thing. If they feel like they're ready for the tougher competition and playing up against, you know, uh, players a little bit older than them in that regard, then yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, sometime in the Marty's definitely wouldn't, wouldn't hurt anybody, even for a top player like Matthew Nyes, um, even Nick Robertson, you know, he spent last season with the Toronto Marty's looked really good. Off to a good start this season, but, you know, the injury that forced him out eight to ten weeks. But, you know, we saw him come back stronger than ever, and he looked really great. So anytime when you have a young prospect to try and get them more comfortable and still try and improve their game, the the best way through is through the AHL as well. Uh, that, that'll that really help them with their development. And in the long run for the Maple Leafs at the, uh, at the pro level. Yeah, and I mean... I, I think that's the comforting part is you're, we, we've been kind of waiting to see how many of these younger prospects the Leafs can put into their lineup because 
it's a little easier to supplant your needs when you have them internally versus, you know, having to go out and pay a, you know, a fourth or a fifth round pick for a guy who comes in, fills in your needs, but then, you know, might fall out of favor or, mm-hmm. you know, instead of spending those assets, you can get a Nick Robertson into the lineup. I, I kind of like that decision more than let's say going out and, and, you know, trading for someone because again, that just means you're taking away draft picks from your your scouts. And from what I heard about from Kyle Dubas, one of his first talk, his first like media reports a few about a month ago, was that we don't really want to take these picks away from our scouts constantly. Like these guys want to kind of feel like their work is is leading to something and not just be mm-hmm. like. All right. Well, we did all this draft work. I guess we're not going to be actually picking anyway because we keep trading away our picks. Um, so I, I feel like yeah, the Leafs kind of will have to find that balance going forward. And I I, I wouldn't hate the idea of a Matthew Nyes coming in because we saw what Cole Caulfield did for the Montreal Canadiens. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I look at also uh, what McAvoy did when he came for the Bruins. Yeah. He was their top defenseman in that playoff run that they had. Like, I I think maybe we tend to look at their age and think that it's too soon, but don't really account for the player and what they're able to do. And I think, I mean, I I think there's maybe some recency bias with with Matthew Nyes and hearing his name being flowed out there as, you know, if the Vancouver Canucks wanted to trade JT Miller, Matthew Nyes would have to be included. That's what every Canucks fan Mm. was telling me in those comments. Yeah. I'm sure that made you cringe to hear when you hear Matthew Nyes' name. Um, um, it was it, it was really tough to even hear Topi Nemelo's name because I really love him as a right-handed shot defenseman. Um, but like you said too, I mean, you want to try and hold on to those picks and not try and buy your way in and try and build your roster through within. And even so, looking at they were they want to try and like add a top six for it as well. But you also look at the impact that Nick Robertson could possibly have. And at times, yeah, he's looked a little bit off, still learning the ropes at the NHL level. But there are times where he's shown the speed, the shot, the creativity that he has. And that just screams top six potential. So you you want to get them comfortable. You want to get them some play time and see what they got. Yeah, I, I just I, I, I'm I'm very much I mean, we went through all those years of liking and we were all fixated on these prospects. Mm hmm. And I feel like getting that back in would kind of just feel a little bit, a little more surreal considering, you know, the vibe around this team right now and the kind of the younger guys kind of stepping up their game a little bit. So we're going to take another short break because there is a game that we do have to talk about. It's a special game in terms of the date and what the Leafs will be wearing. So we'll talk about that when we come back after we hear from our other show sponsors. And welcome back to the Locked on Leafs podcast. David Morris City here with my guest co-host, Peter Berrettini, uh, who is a writer over at the Hockey Writers and also ho- a co-host of the Sticks in the Six podcast. So I don't know if you saw the videos and the pictures from Leafs practice today. We got those sweet St. Patty's green going on. Beautiful. <laughs> I just love the fact that they're not just doing these for warm-ups like you see the other teams do. Mm-hmm. They're like, nah, we're wearing this stuff. Like, this is our our gear. I I'm a huge fan of the goalie gear with the with the brown pads. Oh yeah, per- perfect combination there. Fantastic. Um, I'm actually going to be going to this game. This was a, a a postponed game that was initially supposed to be a Devils game in January. COVID happened, so we were able to swindle the tickets for this game. So I get to break perfect out my timing. I forget to break out my St. Patrick's jersey. It's one of my favorite jerseys that. I only get to wear about once a year. So, <laughs> like perfect. My... If you don't wear this jersey, then you really drop the ball on that one. Oh, I mean, I have a, I actually have a St. Patrick. Do I even have it down here? I don't have it down here. I have a St. Patrick's Day hat as well, with like it's like green with uh, almost like a plaid design. Ooh. I will be, I will be looking like I'm Irish, but nowhere close to being Irish. As you can <laughs> see by this Ferrari shirt, I am definitely not Irish. Um, but. When you look at this game, we already know that Eric Schalgren will be making his second career NHL start, looking to build off of what was a pretty impressive debut nonetheless. A little bit of a different challenge this time for him because not only will he likely be going up against Frederick Anderson, who will be enemy number one when the Carolina <laughs> Hurricanes <laughs> come into town, but 
another game without Austin Matthews. And let, let's, I, I mean, we're kind of just hoping for more of the same like from what they did against the Dallas Stars going up against Carolina, who this is like a measuring stick game in a lot of ways, just like it was early in the year when Carolina came to Toronto last time. Yeah, and you mentioned the last game that they played. Uh, you know, they won, you know, 4-3 in overtime. Um, really great game from both Matthews and Marner um, leading the charge. Um, but the only difference is right now the change of goalie in that. And Peter Morazic looked, you know, somewhat shaky in that game. And, and as we've seen throughout the course of his tenure as a Maple Leaf, really shaky and inconsistent starts where he's good for two. Um not so great for the stretch after that. And, you know, with, with his recent play against the Coyotes and the Buffalo Sabres, you really have no choice. Uh, you, you really want to try and you brought up Eric Schalgren for a reason. You want to try and see what he can do. He answered the call in his relief effort in the against the Coyotes. He kind of sparked the comeback with a couple of early saves and even some high danger ones where it was a, in a high traffic area in front of the net. And then, you know, he posts a shutout against the Dallas Stars in his first ever start at, on home ice. I mean, that, that's just a really good feel-good story. And, you know, I, I mentioned this online after the second period of the Dallas Stars game. If, you know, he plays well for the remaining 20 minutes, he should start against Carolina. Depending on the, re- I don't, I, I'm not even looking for a result like win or loss. But if it's a really, really good game and he has the same type of consistency that he did against the Stars, he should start against the Nashville Predators. That game against the Nashville Predators, if he plays extremely well, same thing. Not so much of a, ma- uh, you know, four nothing shutout or win loss kind of thing. But if it's a three one three two win or loss, like a really close game. I think you have your answer about who's going to be the odd man out once Jack Campbell makes his return. Um, we, we have enough of a sample size with Peter Morazic. And again, it seems like every game that he's playing, he's very aggressive with his movements, overshooting, not square with the, with the shooter, um, panicking when he loses uh, focus of the puck. With Shalgren, it was a different story. I mean, early on in the Stars game, I think they got five shots on him including the two-on-one and he wasn't phased at all he was dialed in right from the start and then the maple Leafs started to build off that momentum just like they did against the coyotes and you know end result was a shutout for shalgren so the fact that he's more comfortable he's more confident he's more poised and he's able to track the puck a little bit better i mean that's the consistency that you want to see in a goaltender and the, and again you mentioned that this is going to be a measuring stick game it's going to be a little bit more difficult than the dallas stars although the stars do have quite a bit of offensive powers but you look at the carolina hurricanes and what they got i mean sebastian ajo sveshnikov tara vinen vincent trocek uh jordan stall is still looking pretty good they got a really solid top six and even i'm not even just going to say top six a full top four or, or a really steady steady forward unit all four lines click and all four make a significant impact so it's going to be a really good test again if um he has a really good game i i you got to look forward to him being the starter for the next game and given this week is very imperative how goaltending has been a major issue in question mark and if kyle dubas is going to go after a goaltender and ad- probably address all three positions you have your answer and maybe Peter Morazic may be on that trading block and it frees up quite a bit of space to address the needs that he wants to address in other areas and freeing up that close to $4 million. Yeah. And there was a couple, I, I was listening to Kipper and Bourne today and mm-hmm. you know, people get bullish on, you know, can't overreact to one game. And I, I liked what you said in terms of, let's see how he does over a three game stretch. And anyways, it's like a three. It's three games in a period almost. In in yeah. this case, when it comes to a small uh, sample, though, to Shalvin, it's a small sample. I totally mm-hmm. get that. The next game after the after the Nashville game is March twenty third against the Devils. Then it's the Habs. I think in that time, you're likely hoping that Jack Campbell's close to returning because yeah. given that two week hiatus, and they know better than anyone what his status is going to be like. Because they ha- they know the injury better than we do. They know what his they're talking to the doctors. So even let's say they don't, tra- maybe they they do trade a Mrazek and maybe they get another goalie, and they feel like they can run with three goalies who maybe don't have the same cap hit in terms of what they have right now. Because Mrazek, 
that his calf hit looks really, really bad right now. Oh, yeah. And really, I, I kind of feel like when you see how Shalgren plays, and he plays kind of more like most goalies in the NHL do, and you look at how Mrazek plays, and he plays like not many in the NHL play <laughs> yeah. like Peter Mrazek. Like, I, I kind of just feel like you can find another goalie that, you know, isn't of the level of the Marc-Andre Fleury, the Braden Holpies, maybe somebody that's that can fill in for a few games. And if you if you hope that Jack Campbell is back, because I kind of feel like it's Jack Campbell's net as soon as he, as he comes oh, back. Yeah. And so, like, Peter Mrazek kind of would be on the outside looking in if Shogren looks good. So, yeah, I kind of feel like if they trade Mrazek, I wouldn't be upset. Because I can't, you can't trust him right now. Mm-hmm. You can't trust him to play against the Sabers. You can't trust him to play against the Yotes. You couldn't trust him to play against. I mean, like you can you can pick a few of these games here. So I don't. I just don't see how. You know, trading Razik would then get. I don't think many Leafs Nation would be upset about that. Or even if he's on the outside looking, maybe you wave him and you play him with the Marlies just so that you then have. Then, then at least you can have a little more flexibility in what you move. Because if you wave them, I don't see anybody claiming them either. Yeah. And you're kind of like at a repeat scenario where it's like Nick Ritchie all over again. You know, struggling player. You try to send him down, try and clear waivers. And you, you mentioned that uh, clip with uh, Bourne and Kiprio said with Mike McKenna talking about how, you know, that, that, that type of style, that over aggressiveness where he's like overshooting the post coming way too far out the challenge and then he's getting caught out of position that that, that kind of play isn't going to fly uh, you know you got to be sound stead- steadily or steady in, in your crease and we're just not seeing that and the fact that he had and i believe they even talked about how he didn't have a goalie coach until very late in his career i mean that's kind of very problematic considering how like most teams should have a goalie coach to try and work, especially if you're a young player, because you want to cut all those bad habits out if you want to go far. Yeah. And the fact that he's still having those bad habits well into his NHL career, and they even talked about this as well. Again, that that's concerning. And it, it like you even looked at some of the goals that against early on, like he seemed well out of position and and against the Buffalo Sabres too, he let in that bad short angle goal. Um, uh, I believe I, I, I again. I'm pretty sure it was Vinny Hinnestrosa. Yeah, but even was... the one that the the one that deflected off TJ Brody's skate and in, yeah, you really it's really difficult to stop a deflected puck. I mean, let's face it. But the fact that his reaction time, he was still on the post when the pass was made, and he was looking at basically nothing, and he reacted very slowly. And by the time he was trying to get into position. Puck's already in his face and he's trying to panic with a blocker save. And that reaction time too, you got to be aware of where that puck is going. You got to track that. And I mentioned how, how his puck tracking hasn't been there. That's one of those, obviously, you know, put, you could put the blame on Brody for, you know, kicking that puck in. But at the same time, he's got to be aware that, you know, he's trying to pass it in front and, you know, be square to the puck and try and make sure that that doesn't go in. Cause that was still kind of a pretty ugly goal. Yeah, I, 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 somebody had mentioned that in terms of he still had a chance to stop that that puck. Mm-hmm. It was not like it was rifled into that. I mean, the, even just the Carolina, I mean the Carolina, the the Arizona game. That second goal was mm-hmm. the most ridiculous thing I had ever seen, because no, on no way should a guy fan on a shot and still have it go into the net. Yeah, and. and uh, there's so many. I mean, Steve Dangle took a few stills of where Morazic was when yeah. the plays were happening, and I, you're totally right on this. That a guy who doesn't necessarily didn't really have that foundation of a goaltending coach, it kind of just feels like where did the Leafs kind of think that this was the right move in terms of like <laughs> did they not consult their goaltending coach on this? Like I don't, I don't, I, I did they did they think because he had a good year in Carolina and he wasn't going to cost the arm and a, I mean, in their eyes and not an arm and a leg that that was just the right move. I just, I think there's only one other goalie I heard that never had a goalie coach for the longest time. And that was Martin Brodeur. Pretty sure he didn't have a goalie coach for the, like most of his career in New Jersey. And then eventually he did get one. Like, I don't know. I just don't know where the Leafs, like where, who was the one that really pushed for Morazic. Mm-hmm. If if a guy who didn't work out in Carolina, one of the better defensive teams, 
I kind of feel like that's where, you know, Anderson is thriving more so because of who's playing in front of him at times. I think that's an easier team to be a goaltender for. Maybe that's why Mrazek had the success that he did. Yeah. So no, very, I was just about to say very good point. And yeah. And even so, like, even if he is, did have a goalie coach late in his career, I mean, I mean, every NHL team's got to have one, right? You, you want to work out, you know, the bad habits and even, even at the NHL right now, because even if you get into a funk and you have those bad habits creeping in, you, you, you work on that in practice with the goalie coach. I mean, we've seen clips uh, posted online of them trying to work on their side to side movements for one timers, um, traffic, uh, with, you know, the, uh, I don't know what you call the, 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 the dummies that just stand on the skates and you just yeah, have that try and like move your way around. Almost like the pra- the sh- shot blocking mannequins. Yeah. Like yeah. Those ones. And, it, and even from the beginning of the season until now, if Peter Morazic hasn't learned to cut those habits out and he's not even listening to the goalie coach, who's really at fault here? I mean, yeah, you want to try and give him that chance and opportunity again, because let's face it, the Maple Leafs needed a goalie price probably obviously doesn't match what, what he, what he's playing with right now, but you want to try and get their reassurance and try and get his game back on track. It's not looking good at all. <laughs> yeah. Based on the, especially these last two months, because we know how tough the goaltending situation was. And we have kind of have an idea with Jack Campbell and his play with the rib injury, but Peter Morazic has had time and time again to try and work everything out, and he just hasn't. Yeah, and I and, and people some are just like, ah, oh, give him a chance, give him a chance. This I've we have seen the Leafs cut a goaltender ten games into a season. I don't remember, if I remember the Jonas Enroth fiasco. Oh yeah, which then led to Curtis McElhinney joining the Leafs, which ended up almost I think almost saving that season because if they didn't have a backup goalie. Like, it, it, I think it just goes to show, like, the Leafs were trying to make a conscious effort to have that 1A, 1B. Mm-hmm. And I think they they kind of, they definitely miss. I, I wasn't a fan of the Mrazic signing. You obviously look at the stats and you thought it was going to work. But then you also, then you see him playing and you're just like, eee. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of hoping uh, that the Leafs will get a better goaltending performance out of uh, Shalgren again. Cause if it does, then it kind of, I think it kind of silences that crowd and maybe the Leafs. I mean, we saw the Leafs play, I think with more confidence against the stars than we've seen the play in the last two mm-hmm. weeks. And even so without Austin Matthews, it's going to be even more of a difficult challenge considering he scored two uh, last time they played the Hurricanes. So I think maybe right now, if they're able to try and replicate that success with scoring by committee committee against, you know, a deep Carolina Hurricanes that plays in the exact same way, high octane, high tempo offense, without one of your star players, I think this is going to be a really good turning point because they they know pretty much well Frederick Anderson's weakness, um, or he, he may have improved on them ever since because uh, out of the five years that they played against him, it seemed like his glove hand was a little bit off. But even so right now, um, that last game, they did a better job of trying to get in front of the net and make it uncomfortable for him. Um, getting traffic, low danger, low danger, or not low danger, but high danger shots, you know, get it off the pad, try and get second and third opportunities. If they're able to capitalize that and crash the middle of the ice, I think that's going to be a good recipe for success for them. Because even so, if they're capitalizing on like creating turnovers where, you know, Mitch Marner had that, you know, easy breakaway, uh, Deke on Anderson to try and tie or to tie the game. You have that counter game, you have that speed, you have that agility, and you have those smarts. I think you're looking at a really good or a possible close game again, and even possibly a win. I mean, the, again, the fact that they were able to win without their top sniper against the Dallas Stars team, who may not be that much in contention of a playoff spot, but still really dangerous, it's a good stepping stone, and they should feel good about that going into this game. Yeah, and I also just think that John Tavares kind of silenced the doubters a little bit when they everyone was. I've I've been, I mean I've been I have been quite I've I've kept things to myself on this whole Tavares thing. I think I even had this reflection on uh, kind of after the game. It's just like, you know why John Tavares also took eleven million dollars because playing in Toronto is damn hard. Oh yeah. Like, I'm sorry. Everyone's like, ah, Austin Matthews should have been captain. Mark Morales should have been captain. But guess what? Tavares, the reason why they put it on him 
because you did not want to put that pressure on an Austin Matthews or yeah. Morgan Riley. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Yes, I think they're both fantastic players, but there's a there's an extra responsibility that comes with being a captain, and I think Tavares has had to answer for a lot that maybe he shouldn't even have had to answer for. I give him a lot of credit for doing it, and it was just so nice to see him have that game against Dallas. And I think he, there's no reason why he can't do it again. I also kind of think maybe it's a bit of a wake up call for the coaching staff that, you know, they kind of called out Tavares and, and Nylander for how they've been playing. Maybe, and, and look, I'm a big Nylander guy. Maybe the, maybe the criticism should have been, you see how Tavares played and you're just like, hmm, maybe there's something to how his line mates around him and the constant juggling. Of mm-hmm. that of that line hasn't really helped him in that regard. I, in my opinion, I think Nick Robertson, when he was there, that was when the line was at its best. Yeah, and you mentioned William Nylander too. I think during the stretch of like the last two three weeks, he he's been noticeable, but he's made some glaring mistakes. And you know, w- you know that there's a fan base that just absolutely hates William Nylander. Um, you know, to see him make the mistakes. Yeah, I, I, and even Keith said that he needs to be pushed in order to be at his best. So I think he needs to get back and be a little bit more tough on him in order to get him at his best. And I do agree that, um, you know, Tavares has just received quite a bit of flack. I mean, this is a player that already surpasses 50 points last season, is going to surpass the 60 in 2019-20, where he missed some time. I believe he had a broken finger as well. Also came back from an injury where he had the oblique injury where he missed the world hockey championship and he was supposed to play in that. So that was a rough year for him. And he had 60 points. He's already at 57. If, if everyone is just complaining that, Oh, he can't score goals again because of the 47 that he had in his first season. Yeah. Well, guess what? John Tavares plays the way John Tavares plays. And that's, you know, being aggressive using his hands to his advantage. He's not the best skater, but he's able to get in, into that inside edge. And he, we're seeing that quite a bit. Even when he wasn't scoring, he's still piling the assists. I mean, what the, what more do you want? Assists are more important than goals. And the fact that he still reached 20, despite going on that, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, streak where he didn't score a goal. I mean, what else can you say? I mean, you really can't. I mean, yeah, the the contract that is still going to stick with a lot of people, eleven million. But you know what? He's still performing. He's still playing well. I I I I just don't get it. And I also think with Tavares, it's not a lack of effort. Mm-hmm. It, it. I don't think at any point yeah. I could ever question John Tavares's effort or his desire because mm-hmm. you see it when he when things aren't going well. I kind of mentioned he shows that. it. It's, it's not always great to show it, but I think for those who are criticizing, I think it's important for them to see it because a person that shows it, it means they care. Yeah. Uh, so I think, uh, I, I, I think Tavares, I think it's proof there. He's proving that put him in the right situation or, you know, he, if he is in the right situation, I don't even think you need to put him in the right situation. Mm-hmm. I just think if he knows he needs to step up, like he did with Matthews out, he will deliver because that's what you paid him to do. Absolutely. All right. Uh, I think that will do that. Do it for us on the podcast here today. I'd ri- really like to thank uh, Peter for joining us. Uh, I mean, it's always uh, great to have guests on. And with Mike being out, this gave me a chance to expand and bring in some people around the hockey uh, hockey community. So I was really happy to have Peter on. Uh, Peter, is there anything specific you want to throw out to the to the crowd, to our audience, to have them t- check out? Whether it's a story, podcast, we're always looking to have you, you know, everyone share their work. So go right ahead. This is your chance. Um, I, I just head on over to the hockey writers. I mean, we got a fantastic writing crew. You know, spanning all all NHL teams. Um, you know, prospect coverage ha- is going on. We're covering the trade deadline. Um, you know, it, 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 it's just nonstop coverage over there. So I, I highly recommend giving every, every piece of read, whether it's, you know, um, Leafs, I'm going to throw in the Canadians because, you know, the Montreal Canadians are pretty good. Um, you know, with, uh, the potential future and rising of Cole Caulfield, you know, even from, uh, every other team there, I mean, uh, it, I, I can list, uh, a bunch of great writers, um, that do a fantastic job. 
I, I just highly recommend going over there and check out all, all of our work. It's it's been a really great, um, really re- really great experience we're writing for them and having all these writers there. So yeah, go ahead and check out the website, um, YouTube channel, everything. All right. Well, make sure you go and check on that. I'll I'll add that. Uh, his page into the description, both for the podcast and for the YouTube channel. So you can make sure you go and check out Peter there. Also make sure you go and subscribe to the locked on these podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts and make sure you follow us and subscribe on YouTube, trying to get to that 500 sub subscriber marks. We can give away some leaf swag. And I do have some nice little things to give out uh, depending on how, how, how we get up there. Uh, hopefully we can give some good things out. Make sure if you have any questions, I did see a question on there and I couldn't, f- it kind of disappeared on me because I was hoping we could have answered it on the show. But if you have any questions for us, um, I do have another guest coming on after the game on Thursday, Mr. Tony Ferrari. Uh, he's a oh. veteran on the podcast. Uh, I know many of you know him uh, for his work over at the hockey news and then many other platforms as well. So great stay guy. Tuned. Yeah. Stay tuned for that episode. We'll be back tomorrow after the carolina hurricanes game which i will be in attendance for so i might be in a good or a bad mood <laughs> i don't feel like there's gonna be in, gonna be an in-between after this after that game so until it's then, never an in-between no never an in-between <laughs> never it's a roller coaster of emotions it's not a glass case of emotion it's a roller coaster because it's always up and down so make sure you follow us and until next time keep it locked right here on locked on leafs <laughs>